I want to invite you this morning to open your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And we wrapped up our series in Jeremiah last week. And we've got a, uh, an Easter series coming up. That, uh, and then I had uh, three weeks in between. And I didn't want to jump into our next uh, longer series. So we are doing a three-week review of our missional priorities. Those things that we believe God has called us to as a church things that we are seeking to equip you with so that when you walk out these doors into your mission field, then you will be equipped to impact those that God has called you to reach as well. Those that are within your sphere of influence. So let me begin. A uh, number of years ago, we began, uh, the staff and, and myself and our families, hosting about every three or four months an event that we call Pizza with the Pastors. It's just an opportunity for us to begin to interact a little bit with some of the new faces maybe that have come into the church. And some of you have been a part of those in the past. Some of you who are long timers are saying, well, we never got an invite to that. Well, if new people would quit coming, then maybe we could get back to some of those 30 or 40 uh, year long people who've been here uh, you know, for, uh, for centuries. Um, but anyway, one of the things we started doing over the last couple of years is during that pizza with the pastors event to actually ask folks the question, how did you how did you stumble across our church? What led you here? And it's been interesting just to hear some of the responses like uh, several years back we actually had a lady who said, "I listened to 6 months of sermons online before I actually stepped foot in the church and I thought it probably took you 6 months to actually find one that was any good but but some of the other responses you know involve like location like you know we moved to the area and it was too far to continue to drive to our other church so we decided to uh, you know try out a new church for some it was based on uh, people that they knew that attend here or or people that maybe had invited them that attend here for some, it was maybe some of the programs. You know, that middle school bike trip that you guys have been doing for 30 some odd years. That was, uh, you know, something that intrigued me. Or, you know, your, your youth program or the Iwana program. And I'm here this morning to say all those are, are fabulous and we're grateful that God used those kinds of things to draw people to this place. But at the same time, I hope your real purpose and reason for being here is a vertical focus. That it's here about, uh, you're here uh, about your love for God and your desire to continue to grow in that relationship with God and to impact others uh, for God. And ultimately, leadership's desire is that each and every one of us who call Ravenna Baptist Church home would embrace the mission that we believe God has called us to as a church, to equip you and for you as well to carry that mission forward into the community. And so this morning we're going to be uh, diving into that first missional priority, which we believe is to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others. That's one of the things God has called us to. And so I want to jump into uh, Deuteronomy 11. And this is one of the passages where we see that portion uh, spoken of in Deuteronomy. I mean, throughout the book of Deuteronomy, it's mentioned over and over and over again as far as loving God. But this particular passage, along with Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy 11 and Numbers chapter 15 are part of a traditional prayer that good Orthodox Jews would repeat both in the morning and in the evening called the Shema. And, uh, and, and so they would repeat that. And so we're going to look at this portion here in Deuteronomy 11, which, which really reflects well on Deuteronomy chapter 6 and also then uh, talking a little bit about Jesus' interaction with some Pharisees when they asked him about what the most important commandment was. So let's jump into Deuteronomy 11. We're going to read verses 13 through 21, just to get a little bit of a framework so you'll know where we're going this morning. This is uh, Moses and kind of his, his final sermons, if you will, for the nation of Israel. They are standing on the edge or sitting at the edge of the Jordan River, waiting to cross, 
And these are, you know, kind of Moses' last words because he is about to put, uh, hand the baton of leadership over to Joshua. Moses would not cross into the promised land with them. And so these are his last and final thoughts that he shares. So Deuteronomy 11, look at verse 13. So if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and oil. And I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Let me stop there, because ultimately, that's what our entire last series through the book of Jeremiah was all about. That's exactly what happened. They weren't careful, and they began to worship these other gods, and so then God had to bring discipline on the nation. Verse 17, Then the Lord's anger will burn against you. He'll shut the heavens so that it will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce, and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give your forefathers, as many as the days that are the heavens that the heavens are above the earth. So the, the conversation that Jesus had with some Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, we're not going to turn there this morning, revolved around some of the principles taught right there by Moses to the Israelites just before they were to head into the promised land. And one of those is that key a missional priority that we as a church have adopted as well, to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our hope and our desire is that you would embrace that truth and carry it with you. So there was a young soldier and his commanding officer who got on a train together. The only available seats on that train were right across from a very attractive young woman who was traveling with her grandmother. And so they sat down in those two seats and they began having conversation amongst the four of them and that young soldier kind of eyeing that attractive young uh, woman. There was obviously an uh, immediate mutual attraction. Well, suddenly the train went into a tunnel, sending the entire train into darkness. And there were two sounds that were heard. The first was the smack of a kiss, followed by the whack of a slap across someone's face. And so the grandmother immediately thought, I can't believe he kissed my granddaughter, but I'm glad she gave him that slap that he deserved. The commanding officer thought, I don't blame the young soldier for kissing that girl, but it's a shame that she missed slapping him and hit me instead. <laughs> the young girl thought, I'm so glad he kissed me, but I wish my grandmother hadn't slapped him for doing it. And as the train just came out of that, uh, that tunnel and back into the sunlight, the soldier couldn't help but smile. He'd managed a brief embrace and a kiss with that beautiful young lady and also an opportunity to slap his commanding officer and get away with both. Now, why do I tell that? Yeah, to add a little humor, but ultimately that idea of that embrace. That embrace is what I'm hoping that we will wrap our arms around as well to embrace the missional priorities that we believe God has called us to as a church. Now, a number of years ago, church leadership read through a book by Tom Rainer called Simple Church. And after plowing through that book, we really felt led to kind of redefine our missional priorities. We had a mission statement that was very biblical, but it was very lengthy, somewhat even uh, maybe cumbersome and something not memorable. Um, as your pastor, I could tell you that I could not have quoted that mission statement. And so we wanted it to be something that each and every one of us could embrace, understand, and hopefully live out. And so we ended up after quite a bit of wordsmithing and everything else, come down to four L words. Love, 
learn, live, lead. Love, learn, live, lead are, in a sense, our L4 mission. And so you're out there this morning and you're saying, well, why do we start with love? Okay, let me, let me address that in uh, just a couple ideas. You know, we can't effectively lead, which is one of those other L words, we can't effectively lead people to a God that we don't truly love and love with passion and commitment. If we focused on living prior to loving, that can end up causing us to think that it's our good works, our deeds that have earned God's favor. We can end up trying to earn God's acceptance by living right. And so that ultimately turns into a focus of what I need to do versus what God has already done for us. Now, I will admit that we, there could be an argument that's made that we should talk about learn first. Okay? We, we are living in an increasingly secular society. There are many here within our quote-unquote Christian nation that maybe have never stepped foot in a church, maybe have never actually held a Bible or opened a Bible, maybe have not heard about God, but I'm fairly confident that I can say that the majority of the people that gather here on a Sunday morning or that view us on our Facebook site or on our YouTube site probably have at least a small understanding, at least a minor understanding of who God is. So that's why we begin with the, 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 the first L, love. Those are our missional priorities. Love for God. We are committed to great commandment living, to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are committed to learn from God's Word together. Whether that be here in our Sunday morning worship service, whether that be in our Awana program, in one of our Sunday school classes, in our ladies' Bible study, our men's Bible study, or maybe in a small group that you feel led to start just because the church doesn't uh, uh, you know, offer that, doesn't mean that uh, you living out your love for God can't reach out to your neighbors um, or your friends and say, hey, I'd like to start a Bible study. God's Word will also help us to live out our faith more effectively, which is that third L. As we love God more deeply, as we learn more about Him, it helps transform our lives so we live more effectively for the kingdom. And that ultimately helps us to lead more effectively within our homes, with our families, within our church, within our community, in your workplace. You become a better leader and maybe even having the opportunity to bring someone to the foot of the cross and have them ultimately make a decision to follow Jesus. You have led them to the life-transforming work of God. So again, today we're wrestling with that first L, love for God. Matthew 22, I mentioned it already, that Jesus was having a conversation, had kind of uh, finished a conversation with the Sadducees. And as soon as that conversation ended, a group of Pharisees, uh, some Jewish religious leaders, um, lawyers, if you will, approached Jesus and they asked the question, Jesus, of, of all the laws, what is the greatest one? What is the greatest commandment? I mean, that question itself was one that the Pharisees debated amongst themselves. You see, the Jews had 613 laws. Which one's the most important? 365 of those were, were negative commands, one for every day. 248 positive commands. And they, uh, I read this, they said that uh, 248 for the 248 parts of the body. Those are 248 parts. I don't know. I mean, those of you that have hair, like you probably got to, you know, if you include all those strands of hair, um, that's more than 248. Some of us are a little challenged in that particular area. So we might have less. But they place them in two separate categories. The, the heavy commands and the lighter commands. The heavy commands would be those that they would deem to be more important. And they would really prioritize those. The lighter commands, not quite as important. And so they typically emphasize the heavy commands. So as that one lawyer approached Jesus, the spokesman, if you will, for the crowd, uh, he says, Jesus, which is the most important? And Jesus answered without any hesitation. And it's interesting to think about. He didn't stop and say, hmm. 
You know, that's a really good question. Let me think about that and get back to you on that one. No, without a hesitation, Jesus said, the most important, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That if you follow the first one, that naturally leads to following that second commandment. And so Jesus, what he spoke actually was a portion of Scripture. Again, the Shema, we talked about it already. But it was a portion of Scripture that was often written on little pieces of paper or pieces of parchment. And uh, it was rolled up and, uh, and put into a thing called a phylactery. And so some of the Jewish men, when they'd go to pray, they would wear these little boxes. That's what a phylactery was, this little box that contained this portion of Scripture. And they'd wear it on their forehead or they'd wear it on their arm. That same portion of Scripture was also put into what is known as a mezuzah. And, uh, and that's a, a small little box that was nailed to the, uh, the door frame of the houses, the Jewish houses. And so when they would enter the house, they would touch that. Maybe on their way out, they would touch that. You know, again, I guess I, I can only imagine that probably over time, it kind of became more just ritual. You know, kind of like, you know, those sports teams that as they're leaving the locker room, like there's that particular sign that they all have to touch on their way out. You know, and, and it's really just become more about ritual than really something that, uh, that we've passionately thought about and considered. And so that portion of Scripture, the Shema, again, containing those words, that great commandment living, if you will, to love God and love neighbor. Now, the book of Deuteronomy, where we find that passage, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11, the book of Deuteronomy was one that Jesus quoted from fairly regularly. Okay, three different times after he had finished 40 days of fasting and the devil came to tempt him, every time Jesus was tempted, he responded with words from Deuteronomy. It was like the, the faith-based education that would be passed on from one generation to the next. Kind of like, uh, you know, maybe their catechism class, whatever, would be studying the book of Deuteronomy. For the Jews, it was like their owner's manual, if you will. How to live out that great commandment of loving God. So about a month ago, we were down in Florida for just a few days and just really felt the need to actually eat in a restaurant, okay? We can now do that, uh, at least to a, a minor degree. But anyway, we just, yeah, we needed to get away for just a little bit. And so we rented a car while we were down there. And, and it was a newer car, much newer than what we typically drive. And it had this fancy uh, little gadget where... It was just like a pad that you could put your phone on it and it would charge your phone without having to plug it in or anything else. And I thought, that's really cool. But we couldn't figure out how to get it to work. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're driving 15 and 20 year old vehicles, so our gadgets are a CD player and a drop down DVD player. Like, we know how to run those. But this, this like little battery charger, we couldn't figure it out. So Antonio got out the owner's manual. Okay, there's got to be some instructions in there on how this thing actually works. For the Jews, that owner's manual of how to love God, the book of Deuteronomy. For us, it should be right here. I mean, God is the author of life. And this is the owner's manual that He gave us. And some of us, that's like very last resort like if I've exhausted all other options, well, maybe God's Word has something to say about it. Okay. That should be where we look first. Okay. Uh, for the Jews, yeah, that was the book of Deuteronomy. And so Jesus' statement comes from the Shema, and it begins with these words, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, translated literally, it would be the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Now think about that second phrase for just a moment because it uh, you know, provides support for that doctrine of the Trinity. The Lord is one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there's a secondary meaning as well. Maybe this is the priority meaning. The Lord is one meaning 
that he alone should be worshiped. He alone should be the one that we love and honor and praise. No other gods. And unfortunately, as we study throughout our, our, uh, our plow through uh, the book of Jeremiah, that's exactly what we saw them do, was actually turn away and begin to follow those other gods. Deuteronomy is filled with, with commands and, and, uh, and promptings to have a covenant loyalty and obedience to God. And so when the, those Pharisees pose that question to Jesus, he immediately says, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's an unconditional, committed kind of love. He's urging us to love God with the totality of our being because that's how God loves us and how he hopes we will love him in return. So he goes on to say, love the Lord your God with heart, soul, and strength. So what does it mean to love God with our heart? Let's start there. This is on your outline. To love God with your heart means to love him with the core of your being. It includes your thinking. It means to actually engage your mind. Now, sometimes when we think of our heart, that's not where we go. You know, we think of heart and we think kind of emotion. But for the Jews, no, it meant engaging your mind, your thinking, okay, and loving God with your heart. But there was an emotional aspect. Love God with all your soul, with your innermost being, with emotion. Now, if you've been a Christian for a long period of time, you probably maybe heard this phrase like, yeah, we're the frozen chosen. Okay? We've been chosen by God, but we are loving God with no emotion. This is us. We're not loving God with passion. Okay? Yes, we've been chosen. Yes, we have a relationship with the living God, but it's without emotion. And Jesus very clearly, as he reflects all the way back on the book of Deuteronomy, says, yeah, love God with our intellect. Yeah, with our mind. That's why we dig into God's word. But also, there's emotion involved. We can't be just the frozen chosen. And we're also to love God with all our strength. That means with all our willful determination, with all of our energy, with all of our might. That's the love God has for us. That's the love that we need to reciprocate he loves us with the totality of his being. And so as Jesus is having that conversation with the Pharisees, he goes on to say the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That if we love God that way, it should naturally lead to loving others. So there was a husband and wife who were having consistent conflict. Lots of fights, lots of arguments, and... And one particular day it wasn't going well, and so the wife suggested that they write down their complaints on a piece of paper and then show the other person exactly how they felt. So she thought it might cut down on some of the verbal bickering, so the husband agreed, and so they both got paper and pens, and they started writing. And they would both write furiously for a while, and then the husband would pause and kind of look at his wife and then continue writing again. And the wife would write and pause, look at her husband, and then continue to write again. The wife finally put her pen down, having completed one whole side of a piece of paper. But her husband continued writing and writing and writing. And she started to get angrier and angrier. Tears welling up in her eyes. He finally finished writing after filling the front of one complete side of paper, the back of, of that same side of paper, and the front of another side. And then they exchanged papers, but as soon as the wife looked at his paper, she felt terrible. She wanted to take her paper back because despite his anger and pain, he'd written on every line, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm ticked off and I'm angry, but I love you. And Jesus said the most important commandment is to have that vertical love for God, which then has a natural, natural outflow into loving others, even including our spouses, even when we might be angry and frustrated with them. It should have a natural lead-in to a love for other people. So that love for God 
Which again is that foundational missional principle that the church leadership here believes that, that our church should be about then leads to a desire to learn more about God. And as we learn more, God's Word begins to transform us so that we can live more effectively. And as we live more effectively, that transforms our leadership both in our home, in our community, in our workplace, and ultimately maybe even provi providing opportunities to lead others to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ. So how do we embrace that mission? So I've got a, uh, a chart that I want you to see um, up on the screen. And the chart looks something like this. If you're in education, it's probably something that you've seen before. And it's kind of levels of retention, like how much do we actually walk away with? Okay, and so if you show up here on a Sunday morning and all you choose to do is just listen, you're going to walk away with about 5%. You're going to retain 5% of what we talk about. If you actually bring your Bible with you and open your Bible, that rises up to 10%. Okay, the next level, um, audio visual. So maybe if you're actually filling out the sermon outline, jotting down some notes, maybe the pastor makes some kind of like unique illustration, like maybe you're going to say, oh yeah, that owner's manual thing, that, that kind of really connected with me. Okay, then you may walk away with 20%. If we have a, like some kind of a demonstration or, or somebody else that maybe shares, which we will here at the conclusion of our service, of how they're implementing this, this uh, commitment of loving God, um, that idea, the demonstration leads to 30% retention or take home. But things really ratchet up when instead of us just being observers, we actually begin to practice some of it. So like uh, practice through even just a group discussion raises that up to 50%. So instead of just showing up on a Sunday morning and just being a part of a worship service or worshiping with us just online, where we begin to plug into a Bible study, we begin to plug into a Sunday school class because that helps, uh, uh, again, solidify some of those beliefs even more. We're, we're talking about them in small groups. Okay, that leads to 50% retention. But as we begin practicing those things, 75%. Like the adult Sunday school class that we're doing right now, the, uh, the name of it is actually Love Does. It's action. Love does. It, it serves. It, it, it works. Okay? And you retain 75% when you actually put it into action. And then the highest level of retention, 90%, when you're actually teaching somebody. Okay, when you're passing along those truths, which as parents, grandparents, hopefully that is a regular part of your parenting or your grandparenting, that you're passing along a love for God to your children or grandchildren. 90% of what we teach to others. All right, thank you. You can take that down. So let's look back now at Deuteronomy 11, and I want to very quickly just point out three teaching points, and then we'll hear a testimony here at the end of our time together. God desires retention. And so the first thing in order for us to be effective at passing along our faith to that next generation, did you catch that, those lines in that last song that we sang, the blessing? May your favor be upon us. And for this generation and the next generation and, and for a thousand generations, like that's God's desire that these truths would be so important to us that we would see they've got to be a priority and that we would do everything we can to pass them on to that next generation. And so the first thing in order to be able to do that effectively, you got to love God yourself. I mean, it's, it doesn't get any simpler than that. You've got to love God yourself. And, and that's exactly what, what Moses reminds the people. So if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then he goes on to say there's going to be some blessings as a result of that. Now, rarely will a child be excited about loving God and following God unless one or both parents also express a love for God. It happens, but it's fairly rare to see that happen. So in order to effectively pass along that faith, that love for God, it's got to start with you. Okay. 
Do you have that vertical focus in your life? Is that the priority or is this, you know, coming to church is just, you know, that, that eighth of your, your, your life, you know, that eighth of the pie, you know, for your week. I'm going to give God that, that uh, you know, hour and a half or, you know, if you're here for Sunday school or you maybe come on a Wednesday night or you're plugged into a Bible study, okay, you know, maybe we'll give God a quarter. Okay. God needs to be the hub of your bicycle wheel and everything else comes off of that. He's that vertical focus. That's got to be the priority. And in order for you to effectively uh, pass it on to the next generation or to your grandkids, okay, that's where it's got to start. Second point, we need to live out love. So you've heard the statement, hey, live out loud. This one is live out love. Like you've got to put it into practice. More is caught than taught. It's a phrase that we've thrown around a lot. And it's true. You can talk till you're blue in the face, but if you're living differently than that, your kids probably won't buy it. you got to live out that love. Now, statistically, those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ do so before the age of 18. 83% of those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ do so before the age of 18. Okay? So you need to realize how important of a role you have as a parent or if you've got grandkids, how important of a role that you have in your grandkids' lives. Because faith is not just taught, it's also caught. And one of the ways it's caught is through your commitment to be involved in, in church. 60% of kids who have parents who regularly attend church will also embrace that same commitment and continue that behavior as they get older. And let me tell you, faith is the single most important thing that you can pass along. But your kids, your grandkids, won't ride your coattails into the kingdom of God. They'll have to make that decision on their own. And so more important than the inheritance that you might leave them, you need to leave them an inheritance of faith. That has got to be the priority. That's what ultimately will last. And so look at verse 18. You know, again, before, before we ever came up with this fancy, uh, you know, cool little, uh, you know, pyramid, you know, of learning retention, God already says, I got it figured out. Okay? Here's how to retain some of those principles. And so we've got to live it out. Look at verse 18. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Notice, tie them as symbols on your hand. Bind them on your foreheads. So as God's Word, in a sense, is bound to our hand, that means that it guides all of our actions. It's bound to my hand, meaning it's guiding all the decisions that I make. As God's Word is bound to our foreheads. Again, that's where the, the, the Jewish men would wear those phylacteries. Okay? means that it guides how we view the world. How we're viewing the world. So in a sense, we've got to develop that biblical worldview where we're seeing through the owner's manual, through the biblical principles. Verse 20 goes on to say, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And so as God's Word is written on the door frames, what that means is that it's lived out privately. It's lived out in your home. Okay, so it's not just a, hey, we're going to church on Sunday and this is a, a, a once a week thing. Or hey, you're going to church on Wednesday night. You're going to Awana. Or you're going to youth group. No, this is lived out faithfully in your home. That's what it means, written on the door frames. As God's Word is written on our gates, meaning that it's lived out in the greater community. So it's lived out both privately and publicly. That's the picture that Jesus, that, that God wants us to, uh, to grasp. There's a third thing. We've got to talk about it. We've got to talk about God's love. Talk about God's love. Look at verse 19. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. You know, throughout your day, a love for God needs to be a point of conversation. That's how it's passed from one generation to the next. 
And each morning, Lee will read to our youngest two from a kid's story Bible. Throughout the day, as we have opportunities, we will again talk about the impact that God's Word and, and those truths make on our lives. After dinner, most nights, we, we do another family devotional. And then before our kids are put to bed, we pray with them, and then we sing with them uh, each night. We don't want to go, that to go anywhere outside the bedroom, okay? Because the quality's not that great, okay? <laughs> but we make a joyful noise. And so as I was thinking about, you know, again, this three-week series, one of the things that uh, God just kind of laid on my heart is there's some people who are implementing these missional priorities in their lives. There's probably a lot of them. And I landed on, you know, just asking a few additional people to kind of share. Next week, we're actually going to share, uh, hear from our mission team, the guys that were down in Kentucky and, uh, and so we're kind of jumping from, instead of uh, uh, love God, we're going to jump right from love God to, to the live and lead portion because that's exactly what those men were doing on that mission trip. Living and leading and, and utilizing the skills that God has entrusted to, the, uh, uh, to them. And so that's what we'll, uh, the testimony we'll hear next week. But for today, God just you know, impacted me with, uh, you know, who is it? that, uh, that I, I believe is, is really living these things out um, and, and, and doing a good job of passing along the, uh, the faith to the next generation. And uh, there's a younger family uh, here in our church, Peter and Anita Cantola, that God just kind of said, hey, you know, have them share some of the things that they're doing with their young kids in seeking to further to that next generation the love for God that they have. You know, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, we're told uh, to make the most of every opportunity. We don't know how much time we have, how long Jesus might tarry before, um, again, we may see that second coming, you know, of the Lord. We long for that day in the midst of all that we're experiencing right now. We have no idea how much, you know, uh, before God might call us home. And so we need to make the most of every opportunity. The King James Version actually says this, redeeming the time. How can we redeem the time as parents, as grandparents, as other people of influence, teachers, coaches, that kind of thing. And so I'm going to invite Peter and Anita to come forward. And uh, they're going to share just a few of the things that God has led them to as parents as they seek to pass along their faith to uh, the little ones that God is, in, and, and little ones, but also growing up <laughs> yeah. very quickly. So, Pete? Yeah, thanks. I think um, Anita got the short end of the stick in the first service because I'm in Sunday school. Can you hear me now? How about now? Ah, there we go. Yeah, okay. So, here we go. I was in Sunday school first. Anita had to do most of the talking, all the talking last time, so I think I've got the short of the stick today. Um, first thing that we put on here was um, just trying to lead by example in talking about and, and sharing with our kids, like, hey, here's what God's doing in our life. Hey, this has been a struggle for me. You're doing great. All right, I'm doing great. <laughs> Okay, so that's that one. Um, and then next, family devotion. So most nights, not every night, but most nights we'll go through a family devotion. Right now we've got this 365-day thing, and it's, it's by experiencing God. It's a, it's a daily devotion, and they're quick. It doesn't take long. Um, I don't know, most nights, 10, 15 minutes, you know. But it goes through a passage of Scripture, kind of goes through this application kind of thing, and then we talk about it together as a family by some of the questions it prompts us to. So it helps us to kind of see into our kids' lives what, what God's doing, where, where are they at with God, what's, you know, so that's, that's one thing there. Uh, next thing, we pray before um, going to bed with, with the ch children as a family. So this is kind of interesting because we kind of got this rhythm because, you know, kids fight. You guys know that with kids. And, and so it's like, okay, who's going to pray first and who's doing that? So every night it, we just kind of cycle through, oldest to youngest, where it's like, all right, Finley, it's your turn to pick the order. Who's going to pray first? And so whoever he picks, they have to pray. doesn't matter. 
And so then we go through, go through that kind of a rhythm, and it makes it kind of fun because every night they know somebody else, including Anita or myself, we get to pick the order. And that's another way that where we can see, you know, what is God doing, um, not just generally, but specifically, right? Sometimes it's really interesting, even though Finley's three or our girls, Allie and Clett, what God did for them throughout the day, and it's like, oh, that's kind of cool how God, like, made an impact of visiting people or whatever. It's really been exciting to see how they've taken ownership of that as well. Where we've set the tone for having that pattern of praying each night, they will also now um, take it upon themselves to, if they're having a rough time with something, they will go in their room, shut the door, and they will pray about something. Or they will open up their Bible. They have the Adventure Bible, so they have um, pages in there about uh, what passages you can look up if you're, fearing, or if you're feeling fear or anger. And so they will go and, and look in those Bibles and say, okay, right now I'm just really about, upset about something. And they will look up those passages. And it's, like I said, just very exciting to see them take that ownership, um, knowing that the, we've been trying to lay this foundation, and now they're taking it upon themselves to do it. Okay, um, and the next one here, like, if our, okay, so when our kids are struggling with something, like, bring it back to a biblical thing. Or if we're struggling with something where it's like, okay, listen, this is not what mom and dad says. This is what the Bible says. Sometimes that's just in conversation. Sometimes there's one example, one of our children struggled with something, and I swear to you, it was like beating your head against a wall trying to get this point across, and it wasn't working. And, and very openly, open up the Bible, almost in a sense of frustration. It's like, child, this is what the Bible says, and then read it. And not that this happens all the time, but this happened this one time where in an instant, one of our children like completely turned it around. And I think just having that hierarchy, like it's not just what mom and dad says, but it's what God says, what his word says, and then trying to live that out together as a family. Okay, and then, oh, last point here. We're not perfect, right? We don't hit family devotions every single night, but we try to. You know, I lose my patience with some of our kids or whatever, but we, it's messy, and we just keep trying to plug along with this stuff. Um, another couple of things, just taking the opportunities, the little opportunities throughout the day. We don't often travel in the vehicle these days, but when we do, we have uh, worship music on. And so just learning to love God and um, praise Him through worship music, making sure that our minds were, are filled with um, ways in which we're bringing honor and glory to him. Um, another thing, loving God also by loving others and um, helping them to have their eyes open to the things that are going on around them uh, where people might need help or um, just for an example, um, uh, one of our grandparents who has loved over so many years writing letters to people, um, it's been a way for them to, um, they become pen pals with her. And so they're able to love her um, in a way that she very readily responds to and um, helps to just um, build that relationship as well. That's us. Thank you. I think it's important, you know, again, and that's even where, like, you know, this young marriage class, um, you know, this group that's starting up, you know, as, as we're going through similar situations in life, you know, how important just to be able to have that kind of support to, you know, again, glean ideas from other people. Hey, we've been struggling with this in our marriage. Or, you know, hey, we've been, you know, some of these couples that, uh, you know, I know are signed up have some kids. Hey, we've been struggling this with, you know, with our kids. And just to be able to, uh, you know, maybe even just commiserate together, like, oh, woe is us. Um, but to share some of those ideas, just as Peter and Anita did, of the, of, of the ways that they're seeking to implement this love for God and to pass it along to their kids. Because that's our desire. You know, that's, that's what we believe God's called us to as a church. First and foremost, individually, yes, to love God. But as a church, that we would be filled with people that, that are passionate passionately loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then as we leave this place, going into our mission field, we're doing the same thing. Let's redeem the time. We're going to pray, and then Isaac's going to close us with one final song. Father God, thank you again uh, for uh, this church. 
Lord, I'm grateful for uh, the leadership that spent a number of months really honing in on uh, those four L words, those principles that we believe you have called us to, those priorities. And, uh, and God, we try to you know, point those out. We try to, uh, in a sense, uh, any new ideas or ministries, kind of send them through that funnel, if you will. Hey, how's that, uh, that meeting, what we believe God's called us to? Does it fit? And, uh, and so God, as uh, families begin to consider how they can continue to do that with their own kids, with their grandkids, with uh, neighbors, uh, um, friends, Lord, we just pray that you'll just continue to equip us, give us creati- creative ideas, Father, and, uh, and give us encouragement, Lord, as we seek to, to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength. We give this day to you, and we ask these things in your name. Amen.